Hello everyone! So, this is Ron Bondajohn, and we're trying out a new concept for me. We're going to do just a running commentary track of Season 1, Episode 1 of the G1 cartoon. That being More Than Meets the Eye, Part 1. There's a lot of ones in that sentence. What I would like to do is I'm going to have us here on YouTube... So if you go to Hasbro Pulse, their YouTube channel, they have all the G1 episodes up there. Uh, well, I'm just going to start it at 0.00. You can pop this audio track on and then maybe pop over to a, a separate window or if you have a DVD of the series, pop it in and we're just going to watch it together. So right now, I'm sitting down. I have a bag of Orville Redenbacher. I'm an Orville Redenbacher man myself when it comes to popcorn. Uh, kettle corn, specifically. And we're just going to watch the cartoon together. So, with that said, I have the remote in my hand. I am hitting play on 0.00 timestamp for the very first episode of the very first Transformers cartoon. This would have been released September 17th of 1984. 40 years ago now. We have the intro going now. And of course, we're seeing all the Autobots and Decepticons. I think going forward, we probably won't have the intro play. But it's good to just have it playing for this first time. One of my favorite things about this intro is for years I thought there was an animation error. It looks like Ratchet's supposed to hit Thundercracker, but in the back, Jazz is also charging Skywarp. So that's not an animation error, it's just a very weird editing choice. And of course we got the Transformers name stamp going into the episode. We're gonna get the cool Vince DeCola voiceover in a sec. Here we go. One of my favorite things about Cybertron and the G1 cartoon is how there's always light at the very core of the planet. Like there is a little bit of energy still there. But it's just really, really gross at this point. Um, you also gotta remember, at this point, the Marvel comic's been out for a little bit. The cartoon does not follow the comic continuity. But at this point, the origin story of the Transformers was still... They were naturally evolved from a series of levers and pulleys that just popped up on the planet. And now we're gonna get the first ever Transformers on screen... Will Jack and Bumblebee. With, also, that means that Chris Lotta and Dan Gilvezen are the first voice actors that you'll ever hear in Transformers. Chris Lotta, probably more well known as the voice of Starscream, also the voice of Will Jack. Really cool to think about that two of the most distinct voices in Transformers, he did both of them and they're so different. As for Dan Gilvezen, it's weird. He describes Bumblebee like a breakout role, and it was a breakout role big role for him but at this point he was already spider-man it's a very weird rewriting of history or maybe just a a, a misremembrance where people act like dan gillivison was an unknown he was already a pretty big voice actor at this point and of course we have the blast shield up again that is not crystal has voice for starscream so that's the main three seekers right now when we see those Seekers again, they're going to be very different colors. Bumblebee was shooting at nothing right there. Assuming there was probably a Decepticon that snuck up behind them that just exists off screen. And now we have Hot Link and Bitstream and Nova Storm? Are those the three now? No, they have different names. It's, it's Ion Storm and Hot Link and Nova Storm. And we're missing Acid Storm. Um, and then presumably there's the main three Seekers again. You're going to have... Again, that was a Frank Welker voice. None of those guys are the normal Seeker voices. But we're also getting the Tetra Jets, which is a toy that would come out 30 years later and has never really looked like these Tetra Jets. It is cool to see that apparently the Autobots do have wheels underneath these weird UFO car modes of theirs. All right, and there Will Jet goes. Also, have you ever noticed that Wiljack has like a little radio mounted there? Look to the left of that glowing console. There's like a place for a radio to go as though someone's going to be riding in this. He has seats also, I just realized. Yep, there's Frank Welker as Skywarp. Not using the voice that we would come to know as Skywarp. 
But that's the first time we've heard one of the three main Seekers speak with their normal voice actor, is Skywarp. And there we go, Soundwave in the lamppost mode, which every toy Soundwave's ever had has to be able to take that pose. I love Cybertron Laserbeak's design. We've never gotten a good toy of, of this design for Laserbeak, but it's really cool. Great thinking, too, to not have him turn to the Condor yet. It's a small thing, but you don't see details like that in a lot of the G1 cartoon. Also, you just saw Jazz go by. That was the justification we needed for Origins Jazz to exist as a toy. I will say, they got the car mode for Origins Jazz really, really well. First time we hear Peter Cullen as Optimus Prime. First time you hear Scatman Crawlers as Jazz. These are arguably the two most popular Autobots for the first two years of the franchise. Only other Autobot that comes close to them is Bumblebee. Keep in mind. There's Michael Bell as Prowl. Michael Bell, probably better known for Sideswipe. Uh, he also voices Scrapper. Which, think about that. We we're talking about people who get to rain, uh, voice a whole range of characters. Frank Welker, who's going to be voicing half this cast, is also doing Megatron, of course. Chris Law's Starscream. Look at that pose Starscream's in. It's the best. I love the sassy Starscream poses. Shockwave, my boy. I'll be honest with you, I don't like G1 cartoon Shockwave. Don't like Ultra Loyal Shockwave, but Corey Burton, great voice actor. One of the best voice actors to ever live, Corey Burton. Name a show you like, Corey Burton has been a voice on it, and I guarantee you he was probably the best voice on it. Um, Frank Welker probably has the largest IMDb page of any voice actor ever. It is insane the work that man has done. Chris Lauda, who was a spectacular in his own right, no longer with us. He died a long time ago in the 80s. Um... Like I said, his two most famous characters in the G1 cartoon are probably Starscream and Wiljack, but he also voiced Laserbeak and Buzzsaw, and we didn't know that until a few years ago. Everyone just assumed that Frank Welker did those noises for the, for the Condors. Had the art going off, and also, because they never actually say who Optimus Prime's second-in-command is, it's in this episode that you can glean the fact that Jazz almost certainly has to be the second-in-command. And that's something that they ran with in the comics and in IDW. Um, there's some people who would tell you Ironhide or Prowl. They're definitely like in the inner circle, but it definitely seems like Jazz is the right-hand guy. Uh, here we go. The asteroids. Shaking up everything. Ironhide <laughs> leaking lubricant. You know, that's okay. You know, you're an older bot. You got scared. You had a little bit of a leak. That happens. I also love the fact that apparently the Nemesis is having an even worse time. I, I like the idea that the Nemesis has, like, no defense to it. It's entirely an assault vehicle. Whereas the Ark, because it's a cargo hauler, it's able to take this a bit better. Keep in mind, this is not something set in the cartoon. This is all just stuff you, you gleam from many, many years of writers trying to explain the weird story beats of the G1 cartoon. The Nemesis, what a good design for a ship. The Ark is obviously a great design, but I feel like we never give the love to the Nemesis that we give to the Ark. Also, just the name, the Nemesis, wow. Megatron's big purple pimp throne. So many versions of that thing as a toy now. Third party even has done the, pimp, uh, the purple pimp throne. If you're a fan of Fall of Cybertron, this is a very familiar scene to you. The Decepticons boarding the Ark now. There we go. It feels wrong to not have Soundwave riding that thing. Yeah, also very weird repeated animation here. Um, also, get ready for this. Ironhide drop-kicking Soundwave right into Ratchet who <laughs> then gets tossed. Man, the choreography of the fight scenes in G1 is so wild because because of some of the animation errors and also just due to, you know it being a cartoon that was kind of rushed out, there's so many weird inconsistencies in the fights. Later on, we're going to see how many times the Seekers just completely swap around. And now, first ad break, seeing Jazz go by. There's no ad break. I would assume, because I'm watching this on YouTube, that there would have been an ad there, but nope. We saw Chris Law's Starscream. We're going right back into the act for Act 2. 
This is great. Four million years later. So here's a fun thing. This is a thing that actually happened. I think it was in like early 1984, Mount St. Helens actually did erupt. Um, and that is supposedly what woke the Autobots back up. Also, you look around, there's so many characters here that are just generics. There was like a lime green guy crashed into the console. That's no one. You saw Holler, weirdly enough. Like you saw Constructicon green Holler. Not the last time we're going to see Holler in this uh, three-parter. And first person brought back online is Skywarp. What was really cool about the Skybound comics is they swapped it around to Starscream being the first one brought back instead of Skywarp. There we go. Frank Welker talking to himself. You can see Hound back there just completely destroyed. They're dragging all the Decepticons over, getting everyone back online. Also, when, it's in shots like this where you see just how few Decepticons there were in the first year. You have Megatron, Soundwave, the Seekers, and then everyone else is just generics, Reflectors and Seekers. Um, you're going to see so many random purple Decepticons in these first three episodes, especially. And it's always been a weird thing with Transformers, where the Autobots almost always just way outnumber the Decepticons. Uh, to the point where it almost becomes comical sometimes. You saw in that fight scene how many Autobots Soundwave was taken on by himself, and it's because you can't make up the numbers. You know, the, the, the first great mistake of Megatron as a military commander is he did not just kill the Autobots when he had the chance. Starscream, being a dummy, accidentally knocks... Rocks down to the ship. Optimus Prime's able to be repaired by Teletron 1. There we go. He's all good, guys. He, he's never going to die. He's never going to get hurt. It, that was weird. That was a weird little jump right there. Man. I'm pretty sure this is first cassette we're about to get to. Yep, Soundwave's about to send out Rubble. First cassette out is Rumble. Well, no, no, I say that. Laserbeak was out earlier. First time we're seeing Rumble, at least. Um, I've always loved that transformation for Starscream. And I'm convinced that's how they got the idea how to do Robot Master and then classic Starscream. I just got an ad on mine. I assume that you're going to have the same ads in the same places. So we're going to skip as soon as we can. If you don't have an ad, it might be a good time to maybe pause yours and then we'll catch back up in a minute. I do own these all on DVD. But I figured for most people, maybe you don't have the DVDs. The DVDs can be hard to come by nowadays. YouTube is free. You know, so I thought it was better to record these guys based on the YouTube videos in the hopes that your ads will time with my ads and we don't have to um, potentially lose anyone. Uh, I'm not going to go over any of the ads I'm seeing because it's the usual trash you can imagine. It's, it, it's just there for filler. But, you know. Kind of like watching cartoons as a kid. You gotta sit through the commercials. I do think that they should have had the ads around the ad blocks they already have in the cartoon. Like, when Jazz went flying by, that's when we should have jumped to ads. And, like, you're, you're a big enough company, Hasbro. You could have done that. But at least it happened during a transition. So, we have Optimus. He's gonna be doing his dad walk in front of the Autobots. Here we go, Hound. So, a little fun thing about Hound, and you're going to see it throughout this three-parter. He was supposed to be the main one. He, him, was, him and Spike were supposed to be best friends. And then that role was later given to Bumblebee. Also, Cliff Jumper having his first lines. You guys know Cliff is one of my favorites. Voiced by Casey Kasem. Uh, a, the role he's probably most known for, original Shaggy from Scooby-Doo. And he did that until the day he died, basically. Uh, phenomenal actor. Phenomenal. And he got his star in radio. Also, that's Frank Welker as Rumble. And I love 
their explanation as to why Starscream wouldn't lead is the Decepticons don't respect him. And then Starscream drops the great line that time makes all things possible and he can wait. Like, that's the thing about Starscream, and, well, more specifically, Chris Lotta. He was able to give such pathos to this character. Starscream could have gone old very quickly, because most episodes had the same formula. Something dumb happens, and Starscream tries to take over. It always felt good, because Chris Lotta made Starscream such a believable and such an entertaining villain. Uh, again, if you've seen the news video I did where I talked about... Uh, Peter Duranay passing away. Never forget just how much of these characters and how we feel about them comes from the voice actors working with Emily somewhat dirty scripts. Like, these scripts are not clean. And it was them and Wally Burr, one of the greatest vocal directors of all time, really doing just a tremendous, tremendous job. Um, and of course, we have Hound and Cliff Jumper here. They're spying on the Decepticons. Megatron with his massive eyebrows, his big old unibrow. Megatron's hands, for some reason, always bother me in the G1 cartoon because I don't like how his fingers look. Cliffjumper with the big gun! Yeah! Dead center in the viewfinder, which, of course, on Cybertron means about three feet to the left. So, I've always wondered, like, is Cliff Jumper a bad shot, or is that just they didn't want to show Megatron getting shot in the face? It's because they didn't want Megatron to get shot in the face. Um, here's what's really cool. So, we're sending Laserbeak out. He's a condor now. Hound and Cliff Jumper have no idea what Laserbeak is anymore, because they don't know what a condor is. Which is a great attention to detail. Again... You don't get a lot of that in the G1 cartoon. Also, a thing that Laserbeak will never do again is deploying a little drone of himself. But let's be honest, a little bit overpowered. So we're going to have Cliff Jumper be able to escape because he has glass gas. As for Hound, things are not going to go super well for him. Glass gas, there we go. There goes Hound. Uh, this didn't go well for the boy. Yeah, you see, this is the exact reason why Bumblebee became the Kid Appeal character. You never see Bumblebee getting tripped up by Laserbeak that way. Um, what great bumpers, too. But that's what I'm saying, is they should have had these bumpers still, but then actually put the YouTube ads around them. That orange truck that just pulled up next to Ratchet. That is, well, nowadays we call him Holler. They call him Holler in this, too. That's Grapple. Grapple, at least his toy, was supposed to be part of the original cast. They didn't bring him over. This is the only time he's ever going to be a part of it. Um, Cliff Jumper apologizing. This is not going to be the last time he messes everything up. Later on, he's going to make Mirage out to be a, a big old, big old dick. And it wasn't for any good reason. Cliff Jumper calls him Holler. There, there's no justifying Holler continuity wise. Now we're going to get Thundercracker, his first line, my boy, my big, beautiful blue boy, Thundercracker. We're about to get a great line for Reflector. All three dudes turn into one tiny camera. I love that line. Let's see what you can see. And of course, <laughs> because even on Cybertron, they're still using Polaroids. Reflector is such a cool, and he's not even, he's not a cool idea. He's a, he's an interesting idea that can be done well and has been done well often. But imagine being a kid and being told, okay, you need three dudes and they need to all be complete. And if you have all the pieces and do it right, they can turn into a big camera. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's fine. Reflector, there's a reason why he is written out of the show very quickly. Also, first Ravage. With the implication, of course, being that Soundwave sent Ravage to get rid of these guys who are poking around, trying to figure out why that power plant is no longer there. Uh, a fun thing about Ravage. As a kid, I always thought Ravage was a dog. I never realized Ravage was a jaguar. And I think it's because in Beast Wars, I also thought he was a wolf man there. So... 
You have Hound reporting to Optimus. I don't know what they're shooting between his legs right there. By the way, look at where that laser beam is. It's going between Hound's ankles. Ah, uh, this is great. I used this in the Mini Toys of Jazz clip uh, episode with Jazz sending everyone out. Also, great way to make sure the kids know who to ask for Christmas. You know, make sure the kids know what to write on the list to Santa. Go through all the names right now, dude. That Ready Prime. That honestly might be my favorite jazz line of all time. Is just that start your engines and then Ready Prime. It, it, it's a simple thing. It's a dumb thing. It's a thing I've always liked. And it's a clip that whenever I think of jazz, that's one of the clips that come up. It's that and then a clip in the God Gambit. Which, if we keep doing this, we might be talking about in like a year and a half. Is uh, one of my favorite episodes, The God Gambit. So... A weird thing about Soundwave in these first few episodes is that they didn't really get the V-coder on him right. They would really smooth it out once they get past the first miniseries. Also, Spark Plug and Spike. Keep in mind here, right? This is an oil rig, and they never say how old Spike is. As a kid, I always thought Spike was like 15. He has to be a grown man. He has to be a legal adult to be working on an oil rig with Spark Plug. Also, I'm kind of sad. Spark Plug never really made a comeback. Megatron's about to totally murder four dudes. Yep, there they go. There's no surviving that, by the way. You get hit with a girder like that. I don't care what 80s magic you try to tell me. You don't walk away. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Rumble with the backhand. But it's okay, because Spark Plug can take him now. That, that that's, that's Papa Bear strength. That is... My kid just got hit, so now I have the strength of a thousand middle-aged men. Uh, we're about to get first appearance of the Null Ray. Do they mention the Null Ray? I don't know if they mention the Null Ray. Okay. I know that they call the Null Ray out by name at some point. But seriously, look at this scene here and realize that the Decepticons have no one. They have the three main Seekers and Soundwave and Megatron. Reflector's not even here. Also, Energon cubes are really weird for these first few episodes. They turn into, like, these rainbow colors. I think it's about halfway through season one they become the pink Energon cubes. God, look at how good Starstream looks and how bad Megatron looks in this shot. Like, it's, it amazes me that you could be so on-model with one character and so off-model with another character. <laughs> um, first time Megatron goes into the gun mode... Which, if you didn't know, that's the reason Megatron's the main bad guy. Is because Transformers was pushing a bit of an anti-gun thing. Like, to, to put it in the words of, um... Apologies, I'm, I'm blanking on his name. Bob Bubiansky, in his own words, guns are bad. So, if a guy turns into a gun, he's the main bad guy. Another reason why the Seekers are all bad guys is because they figured, you know, kids know cars. They see cars every day. In the 80s, not every kid's been on a plane. So planes are different. And for a lot of kids, planes are very scary. So planes are bad guys. Uh, as for the cassettes, I'm pretty sure it's because Soundwave was originally meant to be the main bad guy. And the Decepticon logo is based off of Soundwave's head. And that was because of the cassette gimmick. It made sense for him to be the ba uh, main bad guy. So, first battle with the Decepticons... The Decepticons win. Fire is overtaking Megatron. Many humans are dead. All the Decepticons are taken off, by the way. I don't know if you noticed. There was like three Thundercrackers that flew overhead. You have Optimus Prime immediately going to save Spark Plug and Spike. There's going to be a much better version of scenes like this in the Skybound comics. But you have the Autobots doing their best. But this is literally an oil rig that is going up in flames. You have Jazz coming through again. Are there going to be ads? Nope. We're going to get the next time. Next time on Dragon Ball Z. They're going to be taking out the Hoover Dam. We're going to get the best trash talk we'll ever hear from Optimus Prime. Where he literally calls Megatron yesterday's model. And we're going to see some really, really interesting animation with Megatron in the Ruby Mine. So as the credits are going through right now. This is where we're going to call it for tonight. We're going to... Uh, catch back up later on see more than meets the eye part two uh, of course that's only if people enjoyed this first one 
This is going to be the audio track. You guys can listen to this alongside uh, watching it. And then I'm going to post a review just to give you a basic sense of how this was. Overall, for a first episode, I think it was perfectly fine. It introduces you to enough of the characters. Uh, I don't feel like you get a good feel for anyone except for maybe Starscream. He had a lot of good lines questioning Megatron. Even Optimus Prime didn't have much in the actual first episode. Keep in mind that these three episodes would have been played like one day after the next. So if this came out on the 17th, the next one comes out on the 18th. One after that comes out on the 19th. So it's not like a kid would have to wait a long time to figure out who these characters are. But it is always something to keep in mind. Is like, nowadays we see this and we're like, ah, oh, these little character moments. Cliff Jumper with the big gun. Well, for kids watching this at the time, they'd be like, who's Cliff Jumper? Oh, okay, Cliff Jumper's cool. He has a big gun. He got rid of that that weird gun thing that Laser Beak ejected. It, it's fun to go back and look at G1. And I know a lot of people are interested in doing that right now because there's a lot of new people in the fandom, a lot of people who want to go back and just see what the hype was for these older, older episodes and these older shows on Transformers. But, like I said, if there is interest in this, I would love to keep doing it because it gives me something to do at night uh, i'm going to post this audio track alongside my review when i make the review i'm going to plan to start doing those on wednesdays and then we're going to just go like that for a little bit every wednesday i'll release the audio track at 10 a.m and then i'll release the review probably at 2 p.m kind of our normal times but i want to thank everyone who decided to sit down and watch some old Transformers with me. We're going to keep doing this for as long as people are interested, like I keep saying. But thank you guys for giving me a little bit of your time, and hey, we'll see what we get up to next time.